Jesus' name, amen. Oh! 
Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to uh, be with you again. Uh, welcome to New Life Online, and uh, we're excited that you have joined us for this worship service and uh, to, to, to celebrate the Lord with us and to break the bread of life. And uh, I just want to say again how grateful I am for all of you, for your faithfulness, for God, for His faithfulness, and uh, for all of this team. Uh, what a fantastic time in worship, and uh, I know you were blessed by that. And uh, I'm hoping that pretty soon, you know, it, it, you know, you just look, you watch these numbers and things that always look like it's uh, it's moving in the right direction. But I still pray and believe and hope that pretty soon we'll all be able to come back together in the house of the Lord. But for those of you who are uh, not quite there yet and uh, you're, you know, still feeling good at the house as far as um, where you need to be health wise, then we are we are um, so blessed to be able to continue to provide this online service, and uh, we're just going to keep on keeping on. Also, don't forget that tonight that we will be uh, at 6.30, I believe it is. Check the uh, check Facebook page, and uh, but I, I, at 6 o'clock probably. I think it's 6. Um, anyways, double check me to make sure always you can message Pastor Lori or someone who knows better than me about time. But we'll be having our prayer and praise night tonight at the church. There's plenty of room. We'll be social distancing. Everything will be sanitized and clean and feel comfortable to wear a mask if you want or if, if that we will leave that up to you. But we're going to have a time of prayer and praise and worship. And uh, we're excited about doing that as well. So anyhow, um, hopefully we'll see you tonight. Um, and, and, and if not, then uh, you can just, uh, you know, just be praying while you're at the house. And uh, we understand that. We're praying and believing God for everybody's health. And uh, again, thank you, praise team. Thank you, uh, Pastor or, or Clay, who is our leader. And, uh, and uh, Melissa and all the team. Jonathan. And who else is there? Seth. The, the singers. CJ. Um, Nathan. Everybody um, that's involved in that. In that um, I, I, I don't know who's singing. Um, right then, so <laughs> so all of our singers, uh, Lori and Sherry and Savannah and Lacey. So I'm thankful for all of you guys, and uh, we are blessed, blessed, blessed indeed. Um, let me just remind you that you uh, have several options as far as being able to give and take care of stewardship. <coughs> um, you can always go online, and uh, there's probably a link somewhere in the description or maybe in the comment section of this video and, and you can just click there it'll be one click it'll take you right to our giving portal and you can just give that way uh, you can automate that thing if you want to that's a real easy thing to do um, if you know each week what it's going to look like or each month or bi-weekly however that looks you can always mail it in many of you have been doing that and we are very grateful for all of the faithfulness there, and uh, you just keep on doing that. Um, of course, you can uh, you can also um, bring it by if you if you choose. And uh, but you know, just there's several different options there, and we want to thank you for your faithfulness there as well. All right, I want to uh, get into this word today. We began a new series last week called "Not Just Words," <coughs> and this series is about the Bible. If you remember. Um, we talked about the Word of God. Last week we talked about the bread and how the Bible is the bread. It's our bread of life. It's our sustaining bread. It's our daily bread. It's our true bread. And not only that, it is our true bread, that Jesus is our true bread. And so the last thing I told you was that um, Jesus was the true bread. And I want to tie that in in just a minute this week with water. But this week I wanted you to know we're talking about the water. Um, we're going to look at how the water is also um, life-giving, and it is it, it, the Bible is water for us, not just bread. Now, let me ask you this question. How long can you go without food? Think about that. 10 days, 20 days, how many do you think? 40 days, 50 days, maybe longer. How long can the human body withstand without food? Experts say... 40 to 80 days. Um, I know you can go at least 40 because I've done a 40 day fast uh, with no food. Um, so you experts say 40 to 80 days. That's a long time without eating something. 
So let me ask you this, how long can you go without water? How many of you said three days? I mean, that's, that's what I heard all my life, three days. <clears throat> well, actually, three days is kind of a, it's not actually actual or, or accurate unless you're in certain conditions. And really, all of this is dependent upon the condition of your body and where you are. Now, if you're out in the hot sun working and doing all this stuff and, or you're lost and, you know, that kind of thing, three days is about the limit. Um, but depending on your physical condition and the things around you, experts say that the human body can go somewhere between 7 and 21 days. Most, most, most conservative estimates say 7 to 14 days, but I've seen them up to 21 days. 7 to 21 days without water. That's an awful lot of time. Um, but just imagine what happens to your body just going through that process and... You know, it, it's, it's not really good for you to be without food or without water. So if the Bible is spiritual food and water, then how long can you live without it? Think about that. Now, I know we're saved and we're sealed by the Spirit of God. But how many believers are being malnourished because they are not feeding themselves on the food of the Word of God? on the bread of life, on the water of life, who is the Lord and is the Word of God. Think about that. When is the last time you ate spiritual food other than watching or, or being in service or preaching and things? Or when's the last time you drank from that spiritual fountain? Now let me start like by picking up right where I left off last week and I told you guys <coughs> that um, that Jesus was the true bread, and the bread come down from heaven. So I want to show you how God ties in bread and water together, meaning that it's the Word of God. So Psalm 105, verse 40 and 41. We're actually going to have a lot of scripture in this week's lesson. So um, when you see it come up on the screen, just, just say a quick blessing for Pastor Dustin, because he's the, he's the one behind the scenes doing all of that. And uh, we are grateful for his hard work and... and uh, all the hours and the talent and the skill and everything that he puts into that. The sleepless nights. <laughs> um, here's what Psalm 105, 40 and 41 says. The people asked and he brought quail and satisfied them with the bread of heaven. He opened the rock and the water gushed out and it ran in the dry places like a river. So there was bread from heaven, which was called manna. And uh, how many of you realized or did you know that manna actually means, what is this? That's what it means. What is this? You know? <clears throat> In South Georgia, they say, what's this? Right? I mean, that's what it literally means. What's this? It, it was a bread so foreign to them, such, a, such an amazing thing that God provided miraculously. They didn't even know what it was. So we called it manna, and that's what it means. What's this? So, um, you know, some things in the Bible are all, not always just super spiritual. Right? Um, but it was there for them. But I want you to see in this scripture, there was also a rock. And water gushed out of the rock. These were physically there. And they were there for their physical truth or physical provision. But they also show us some spiritual truth. And they have a spiritual meaning as well. They are symbols as well as physical things. There was an actual rock. And the Bible even says, watch this, the Bible even says that that rock followed them. Now, you know that I'm always amazed with the miracles in the Bible that most people overlook. You know, like the Bible saying <clears throat> that they were in the desert for 40 years and their clothes and their shoes never wore out. And to me, I'm thinking like, wow. So, you know, they had kids. There were children who were like, let's say they were three years old when they left Egypt. Well, by the time they got out of there, they were 43. They had sandals that never wore out. So to me, either they were doing a bunch of training of sandals or perhaps their sandals even grew with their feet, which would be also awesome and miraculous and amazing. And their clothes didn't wear out. God took care of them in such miraculous ways. You know, you know, I think it's amazing <clears throat> when the Bible talks about not only did the sea open up, but they walked across on dry land and it dried up like that. And these little things, that they're not little, they're huge miracles. But the Bible says that this rock followed them. 
Now that's incredible. This is actually incredible. How would you like that? How would you like some giant boulder following you around everywhere you go gushing water? Um, but, I mean, these are crazy miracles. You can't figure these things out. And you, you can't even really try. People go, well, I don't believe that. Well, that's too bad for you because I do. And, you know, if, if you say, well, you can't just, you, you can't figure that out. Well, no wonder you can't figure it out. It's supernatural. We've talked about that when we talked about the Holy Spirit. It's a spiritual book, remember? It's a spiritual book from a spiritual being given to spiritual beings. So if you don't get that, you never will understand the Bible. If you don't understand that this book is a spiritual book that was written by a spiritual being and it was given to spiritual beings. It's not just about our life. It is so much about the spiritual. And there are two conversations that are constantly going on in the Word of God. And we're going to see that as it unfolds. Two things. It's the natural and the spiritual. And I'm excited to show you some things today from this Word. So look, there are many, many, many spiritual things that, that, we, that we often miss in the Bible. And if you can ever get past what you see and understand the spiritual things, you will never be able to put this book down. If you can ever start looking past the obvious into the supernatural and the spiritual food that's there, it will nourish you and you won't be able to put it down. I'm telling you, it'll be like the best thing you ever tasted. That's why the Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Never forget that this is not just a history book. Listen, we have God's autobiography by his own hand from himself. Man, isn't that good? I mean, that's really, if you think about it, it's just too good. It's really just too good. <coughs> Excuse me. So we see that he opened up the rock and water gushed out. And I want you to see that this rock had or has a spiritual meaning and water had a spiritual meaning as well. And we've already seen that bread has a spiritual meaning. So look with me in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. And this is what it says. <clears throat> it says, And all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. You see that? See, you guys, some of y'all thought I was lying. Some of y'all thought I didn't know what I was talking about. Y'all thought, I ain't never heard of no rock following them. What does it say right there? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. And they all drank from that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. What did the Bible say? What did the Bible say about Jesus? He was the stone that the builders rejected. When Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Jesus it was and is the rock. That's why the Bible says He picked our feet from the miry clay and set us on a rock. Firm foundation. Now I bet, again, that some of you were like, well, pastor's just stretching things. He's just being an old preacher, you know, pulling things out of it. I'm telling you, it's in the Bible. So the rock that followed them was Jesus. And I already showed you at, in our Pentecost series that the cloud that led them by day and the fire by night was the Holy Spirit. So you see the symbols. The bread come down from heaven. That was Jesus. The rock that followed them was Jesus. The water that flowed out is the Spirit. The cloud and the fire is the Spirit. And so we see all of these things. So yeah, the Bible is full of these fantastic spiritual meanings, symbols, types and casts is what they're also called. The good news is that in this series, we are actually going to have a whole message on symbols and types and casts. And we're going to look at some amazing things from the Word of God. So, I don't know about you, but I'm like, yeah. I mean, you should be excited about that. <clears throat> and if you're not, just, it's okay. Deal with it. Don't tune us out for that week. Just say, I'm going to learn something. Or I'm going to tolerate it. Or whatever the case is. But I think it's going to be really good for you. So, water represented the Word. And we will see that today. And there is, it, this is so important for us to see and know. Because the Word of God is, is, is super important to our life. It is our life source. And because we, in a, we are in a war of words with the world and a war of words with the enemy, 
The world is attacking us and we are at war with words about the word. How many of you have been just here bombarding the people speaking against God and speaking against us and speaking against life and speaking against the Bible? I saw protests, people trying to keep people from going into church and whatever the reason they thought they were, they went inside and shouted over the preacher and, you know, that's not protest. That's not protest at all. That's criminal behavior. Um, but anyways, I won't, I won't get political about it, but the truth of it is <clears throat> we are at a war and this war consists of words and we're going to see some things that really tie in here with the word and the water and the word of God and all of these things. So here's three things we're going to see during this message. Number one, Satan wants to flood us with his words. Two, he wants to famish us with God from God's word. And three, God wants to fill us with his word. Now, those are your three main points in the in the in the outline. <clears throat> and uh, we'll get to those in a second. Here's number one. Satan tries to flood us. Satan tries to flood us with his word. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. Now, I talked about symbolism and types and cast. And I mean, if you think about it, the Bible, it, it, you know, is loaded with these things. And if there's ever a book that's full of imagery and things and you're like, I don't even know what that means. It's the book of Revelation. You know, oftentimes people, especially in these days that we live in, they're like, I want to read the book of Revelation. And people get saved. First thing they want to do is read the book of Revelation. I'm like, don't do that because you won't understand it. Not only will you not understand it, it'll frustrate you. It may scare you. And then you won't want to ever read the Bible again the rest of your life. Um, start in the book of John if you want to start reading the Bible. Um, and then go back and read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and then read John again. And start with the New Testament there. That's where our covenant is. But when it comes to symbolism and types and, 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 and imagery and stuff like that, this is an easy one to understand. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. Here's what it says. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan. <clears throat> I'm going to stop right there. So the great dragon was cast out. That serpent of old called the devil and Satan. So it tells us who the serpent is. The serpent is the devil. Is that plain to see? Is it, Everybody can see that. So the serpent is the devil, Satan. You see that. That's easy. Now look at verse 15 of that scripture and it says this. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman. And we're going to look at who the woman is soon. Uh, and we'll show you this. That he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman. That he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. Now let me ask you this question. What comes out of your mouth? Words. Words. So at least one thing that we are seeing here. Is that Satan spews a flood of words to come against you and to try to carry you away. Let me ask you this. Have you ever had an attack of words from the enemy come against you? You're not good enough. You'll never be right. You'll never do it. You'll never make it. You, you look at your past. You're a failure. You, you, you can't do it. You can't make it. You know, all of these things that come against you, not only from the enemy, but from other people who, who oftentimes are being used by him and, and discourage us. And sometimes we're our own worst, when a, our own worst enemy. We, we will speak ourselves into stuff. Water represents words. David wrote about this as well. <clears throat> Psalm 69, verse 1. He said, Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. Now listen, he isn't talking about falling in a creek or something. Um, if you read through this psalm, he's talking about the words of his enemy. Look at verse 2. It says, I sink in the deep mire where there is no standing. I have come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. Now look at 14 and 15, and we're going to start looking at this, and we'll see what we're talking about. I'm making this connection with the word. Verse 14 and 15 does this. Deliver me out of the mire, and let me not sink. Let me be delivered from those who hate me, and out of the deep waters. Let not the flood water overflow me, nor let the deep swallow me up, and let not the pit, which is talking about hell, Shut its mouth on me. So here he's saying, 
All these words from the enemy are coming against me. All their talk, all their negative, all their stuff, all their banter, all their bad stuff is coming against me. All their plots, all their schemes. And so to remove any doubt at all, let me show you again from David and we can make sure and clear that we're talking about when it talks about the water and the flood and all this, that we're connecting this and talking about words. Look at Psalm 93 verse 3 with me. And it says, the floods have lifted up. Oh Lord, the floods have lifted up their voice. You see that? The floods have lifted up their waves. Now, is, this is the words of his enemies. He said, he, the floods have lifted up their voice. And he's not just talking about the noise. So, we'll watch verse 4 here. This is exciting. I love this part. It says, the floods lifted up their voice against me. But verse 4 says, but the Lord on high is mightier than the noise of many waters, than the mighty waves of the sea. <coughs> so God is mightier than all the words of the enemy or enemies. He and his word is mightier than the mightiest, greater than the great. His words are louder than them all, and he is the one we should be listening to. Here's another one. Jesus shows us in Matthew chapter 7. That the man that builds his house on the rock, you remember Jesus talked about that? He who builds his house upon the sand, the waters, the floods come, the rains come down, the floods and it washes away. But then he says this, but he who builds his house on the rock, he's talking about himself and his word. When the rain comes and the flood comes, it will not be washed away. It's solid ground, that rock, that, 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 that standard, that, that solid foundation. So what we see is God can talk, Satan can talk, but there's another issue at play here. How I many of you see where I'm going with this? Guess who else can talk? We can talk. You can talk. Has your mouth ever gotten you in trouble? <laughs> I just say no comment. So here the water represents words. But not just his word, and the enemy's word, but also your words. Watch this. This is what the Bible says. Proverbs chapter 18 verse 4 says, The words of the mouth are as deep waters. When we, when we talk too much, here's the fact. We can talk ourselves into falling if we're not careful. Why do you think the Bible says that we should guard our tongue and be careful with what we say. Proverbs 6 and 2 says this. You have been trapped by what you said. Ensnared by the words of your mouth. And remember what Proverbs 18 21 says. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Now we have power to agree with God's word as he speaks life over us. Or we have power to agree with with the death that the enemy speaks over us. See, that's what it's talking about when it says life and death, the power is it, 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 in, the, that, that, that's in the power of the tongue. And we talked about this a good bit when we were talking about speaking the pure language during our Pentecost series. But we don't need to be agreeing with and repeating the enemy and the death and the lies and all the stuff that he tries to bring against us. What we need to be doing is repeating the life that God speaks over us. The life that God's word speaks into us. So the word is water. But we have to be watchful about the floods. And the only thing that can defeat the floods, let me read this to you. Isaiah 59 verse 19 says, When the enemy comes in like a flood... The Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. <clears throat> now, many of you have probably heard that scripture often. But let me tell you this. When it says lift up a standard, let me show you what that means. Because we often think, when I first heard this, and I used to understand it this way. Maybe some of you are the same as me. I used to think the Spirit of the Lord comes in like a flood, then the, or, the, or the enemy comes in like a flood. The Spirit of the Lord lifts up a standard, so he puts some kind of barrier in between us and the flood. Is that what you think? That's, that seems natural. That's what I thought. But that's not actually what it means. Literally, this word comes from a root phrase that means, shall put him to flight or drive him away. Now, watch this. So it says, 
When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will put him to flight and drive him away. Now, okay, watch this with me. I know I'm saying watch this a lot, but I want to show you some really, really amazing, cool stuff. We know that at least three times it's recorded in our New Testament that the Word of God put the enemy's temptation and, and problems to flight. That, that, that Jesus defeated, three times Jesus quoted the Word of God to overcome temptation. He had fasted 40 days and the enemy came in like a flood and tempted him and said things like, make these rocks become bread. Man, that's a big temptation after you fasted for 40 days, trust me. And the Bible says a standard was raised up against him. In other words, Jesus put him to flight. The Spirit of God put him to flight. How? The Word. It is written, he said. It is written. It is written three times. He used the Word of God. He used the Word of God, the water, the Word, to put him to flight. Now, he was the Son of God. So let me ask you this. If he needed to use the word to raise up the standard and put to flight the enemy, how much more do we need it? So what we see is that Satan tries to flood us, but here's number two, Satan also tries to famish us. You see, he doesn't want us to have and use the word of God because he understands that the word of God will deliver us. The word of God will set us free. Amos chapter 8 verse 11 says this. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will send a famine on the land. Not a famine of bread. We talked about that last week. Bread. Nor a famine of thirst or for water, which is this message about water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. So here's what, here's what the prophet Amos said in chapter 8, verse 11. The Lord said, Behold, the days are coming when I'm going to send a famine on the earth. It won't be a famine that, that where people won't eat bread or drink water. It'll be a famine about hearing the word of God. Now this is not a natural famine, but a spiritual famine. All through the Bible, there are two conversations going on. A natural conversation and a spiritual conversation. And most people miss the spiritual conversation unless it's something obvious. But what I hope that you're getting out of this series and that you'll get when we're done with this and as you dig deeper into the Word of God is that you'll begin to see these hidden gems, these amazing spiritual contexts that are life for your soul. I promise it'll wreck you and change you forever. And notice this. The Lord said it's a famine of hearing the Word of God. Not a famine of the word. The word's there. There's plenty of word. Is that we're listen, we're seeing some of this now. There's plenty of word going around. There's plenty of people preaching. There's plenty of people pre singing. There's plenty of word to be had, but people aren't hearing it. They won't hear it. By the way, if we would believe what this word actually says. And we would meditate on it and get what it says, who we are, and what we could do in, into ourselves. I'm telling you, it would change everything about you. It'll change your life. It'll change your habits. It'll change your attitude. It'll change your thinking. It'll change your behavior. If you would really believe that the Bible says you would prosper even as your soul prospers. And look, the, the, the word in, in, the, in the scripture prosper does not even mean what we think it means about getting money and all of that. It truly is talking about being set free. If we would just get this word and truly believe it. It'll revolutionize us. And I believe it will revolutionize our world. So famine is about hearing the word of God. So Satan tries to flood us with this, his words, but then he wants to famish us from God's word. You see that. Mark 4 and 14 through 15 says this. This is Jesus talking about the parable of the sower. And he says, the sower sows the word. And these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan comes. What's that word? What's the next word right there? Does it say in a week, in a month? Satan comes a little bit later on? No. It says Satan comes. When they hear the word of God, Satan comes immediately. 
and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. He wants to famish you from the word of God. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought about that. And I really haven't until I started doing some study and some listening and preparing for this. And I heard one pastor talking about this. And he asked this question. Do you mean that Satan can take the word of God out of my heart? Now, that's a scary thing to think about. Your word, O oh Lord, have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. But here this thing says... When they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. Now, how is that? How does that happen? How is it that Satan can come and steal the word that was sown in your heart? All right. Remember I said God can speak. Satan can speak. But also remember this. We can speak. And the Bible says what? The Bible says life and death is where? In the power of our tongue. And the rest of that verse says... And they that love it will eat it. So in other words, this is what it says. You'll reap what you sow. You're going to eat your own words. And so here's what this scripture means, I believe. And, then, and, I, and I believe that <clears throat> I'm going to show you this. Out of the abundance of the heart, the Bible says, the mouth speaks. So think about the heart. Out of the abundance of the heart. So God speaks in many ways. And the word gets in our heart. But then Satan speaks and tries, and his goal is to get the word. He wants to speak something contrary to the word of what God has spoken into our hearts, and he wants to counteract that. And if we speak these things, if we agree with these things, if we start repeating these things that are contrary and opposite to what God has said, these things will get in our heart, and out of our heart we will speak it. And then the word of God that was sown in our heart, the enemy can take that because now we're speaking the negative. Can you see that? And typically, when, our, when this word leaves our heart, our faith will go with it. Right? So we have to hold on to the word of God. We've got to hold on to the word that we receive. We've got to be like Mary and ponder that thing and, and, and contemplate it and meditate. That's why the Bible says meditate on the word day and night. Read Deuteronomy chapter 6 and understand that why the young Jewish children were taught this from the time they could, they could begin reading and understanding. Even before they could read when they could recite the Shema. And it says the Lord your God, the Lord is one and you should love him. And with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And then it goes on to say that you should take his commands and his words. And that they should be in your heart and in your mind. And you should pin them on you. You should put them on your head as frontlets. Everywhere you go, the word should, should be before you, in you, behind you, and all around you. That's why we talk so much about the word. Say the word. Read the word. Pray the word. Preach the word. Sing the word. Quote the word. Memorize the word. The word of God is your life. It is your bread. It is your water of living life. And we're going to see that in just a second. So Satan is trying to flood us. He's trying to famish us. But here's number three. Jesus is wanting to fill us with his word. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 13 says this. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things that the spirit of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Did you hear that? So don't be surprised. Don't be so amazed. Now you understand why you're speaking the word of God to somebody so plainly that they should be able to see exactly what the answer is and they look at you like a mule staring at a new gate like they don't fully get or understand what you're saying. It's like, and you're like, why don't you see this? Why don't you get it? This scripture right here tells us the natural man does not receive the things of the spirit of God because they are foolish to him, foolishness to him. They can only be discerned spiritually. And it's the Bible that begins. And that doesn't mean we stop speaking. That means that we need to do what 1 Corinthians chapter 4 tells us. Pray that God will pull down strongholds. 
and pull down the, the blinders that cover people's eyes. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, that they are mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds and every high thing, thoughts, that, 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 that set themselves contrary, that, that, that try to compete, if you want to say it that way, against the Word of God. And then it says this, that we are to be ready to take every thought captive and then do what with it? Make it be obedient to what? To this word. So Satan's trying to flood us and famish us, but Jesus is wanting to fill us. Man, I don't know about you, but I'm enjoying this. I know I'm trying to be a little more reserved because of my voice and I'm doing a little more teaching today than so much preaching, but... Man, I hope you are getting this message because it is a really, 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 really life-giving word that you that, that'll help you if you'll let it. So listen, we are talking about two conversations. There's the natural and the spiritual. And remember, I told you this, I'll say it again. This is a spiritual book spoken and written by a spiritual being given to spiritual beings. Quit looking at yourself. As a natural person, <clears throat> we concentrate so much on the natural. But you need to understand that you are more spiritual than you are natural. The Bible says we are made in the image of God. And one of the things that means is that God is Father, Son, Spirit. Think about this. He was one part flesh. Jesus come to this earth. Two parts spiritual if we look at it and break it down. It's very simplistic, but I want you to see that. So the body Bible says that we are made in his image in this. We are body, soul, spirit. We are one part flesh, two part spirit. But we let the flesh control. The flesh wants to run rampant. The flesh wants to rule everything. But we can bring it under subjection. We can cause it to be obedient to the word of God. That's why we fast. That's why we pray. That's why we ask the spirit of God to help us. And we submit to him. And then as our roots go deep into him, the spirit fruit of the Spirit comes out of us. Now I want you to watch this conversation with me. Here's the story of the woman at the well. John chapter 4, we're going to look at verse 6 through 14. And I want to show you some stuff here. So he came to a city of Samaria, which was called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave his son, Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there, Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. And it was about the sixth hour, and a woman of Samaria came to draw water. Now, we understand that this was not the normal time for her to come. Pastor, Pastor Clint spoke so eloquently and powerfully about this not too long ago. I won't get too much into that. But we understand she was trying to hide from people. She didn't want to be seen. She was trying to just go get her water and go. But Jesus, if you remember, he said... I've got to go through Samaria. He knew she would be there. There was an appointed time for her. So Jesus said to her, the Bible says, continuing on, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? By the way, right there, New Testament, there's a form of racism. It actually existed long, 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 long before then. But, but I want to tell you, wherever evil is present, all this evil stuff is going to come out. That's why we have to fight hard to bring, to, to bring righteousness and light. So anyways, I just thought I'd throw that out for you. And here's the thing. It says, for the Jews have no dealing with Samaritans. Here's verse 10. Then Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, Give me a drink. You would have asked of him and he would have given you living water. Jesus basically is saying, if you knew who you were talking to, I'm God. So the woman says to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? It's a really good question. Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as his sons and his son's livestock? So here's what she says. Jesus says, 
listen, if you realize what I was saying, if you knew that I was God and I spoke all this world into existence, but I measured this universe with the span of my hand, and I promise you, I've got something that'll change you forever. If you knew what was about to happen, sweet woman, you'd be asking me to give you living water. I'm God, and I'm here with your answer. And she goes, well, where are you getting this water from anyways? And then she says, are you greater than Jacob? And I could see Jesus inside of his mind going, well, duh. <laughs> what do you think? Before Abraham was, I am, he said. Verse 13 says this. Then Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. You see what Jesus did there. The word of God, the word of his power, the word of his salvation, the word of his word becomes water within us, springing up into everlasting life. It's spiritual. Don't ever let anyone tell you that this isn't the word of God, that this is just some book. Listen to me, child of God. This is the living water that will become a fountain inside of you. And it will not just supply water for you, but it will supply water for all around you and give you life everlasting. And isn't it amazing? He said this water is going to spring up from inside out. Watch this. This fountain cleanses and washes from the inside out. See, we always worried about the outside. But Jesus said, you worry about the inside. You let me deal with the inside. The outside will take care of itself if you let me get onto the inside. Well, let me end with this last scripture. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 and 26 says this. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. Do you see that? We're talking about the water. We're talking about the word. We're talking about the power of the life-giving, life-changing, cleansing, amazing word of God, the living water. Our spirits are cleansed by the blood, but our souls are cleansed by the word. Do you see that? See, that's where the war is. In our mind, our soul is what? The seat of our mind, our will, and our emotions. And that's where the war is. If you're having problems with being, and being overcome with thoughts of pride and greed and bitterness and anger and lust and envy and jealousy and, and all of these things that we deal with on a daily basis, if you're having issues with your thought life and trying to get things under control, whatever it is, it's because you're not taking a bath. It's because you haven't let the water wash you from the inside. And let me just say this. Get in the Word this week. Take a bath, will you? You ever feel like telling somebody that? <laughs> I heard somebody say that and I said, I want to include that in my message. Take a bath. This Word will cleanse your soul. Meditate on the Scripture each day. Read your plan, get in the word, do your daily devotion or whatever it is you do. But let me ask you this. Let me challenge you to do this this week. Now, last week I told you to, to start memorizing scripture. This week I'm going to ask you this. Meditate on one scripture each day. Maybe even memorize it. Out of your daily reading. I want you to pick out, let the Spirit of God lead you one scripture that really stands out to you. And I want you to meditate on that thing every day, all day. Meditate on it and see what God will say to you. Now, I want to pray for you as we end this message today. And I want you to ask the Holy Spirit again, as we've been doing at the end of each one of these messages. Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? What are you trying to show me? Jesus is the word. His word is our bread come down from heaven. But it is also our water for our soul. He is the rock that the water gushes out of. 
And the Bible says he follows us. He's Christ. He's with us always. He'll never leave us, never forsake us. This water is life-giving. This water is life-changing. This water is life-cleansing. It'll wash you forever. Friend, I want to tell you something. If you're sitting there and you're thinking, I need a change. I need to do something different. I need God to help me. I can't stop thinking about this. I can't stop acting this way. I can't stop doing this. I wish something would change. You've tried everything else. You've tried to do it all on your own strength and in your own power, and it's just not working. Listen, you need a bath. You need to let the Spirit of God come over you and let the Word of God cleanse you. Call out to Jesus. We're going to pray in just a second, and when we do, I want you to pray with me. And you cry out and call out to Him. And you ask Him to touch your heart. You ask him to forgive you of your sin. You tell him, I repent. That word just means I turn around and I'm going the other way. Not my stuff. I'm, I'm following you now, Lord. He'll change you. He'll cleanse you. He'll make you new. And he said, this water. You remember what he told that woman at the well? This water will bubble up inside of you and become a living water that gives life. Maybe you just need some refreshing in your life. Christian brother or sister, child of God, maybe you're just struggling in this time. And, and you know, with all the things that's happening in our society and our culture and our world, and maybe you think, I don't know, Pastor, I'm about to lose it. Take a dip. Take a dip today in the refreshing, cool water of the Word of God. Man, let it wash over your soul. And let the Spirit of God wrap His loving arms around you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank You. And I bless You for this time that we've been able to spend together and break Your Word, break Your bread, and drink from Your living water. And I pray, God, that You would wash over us with this water. Cleanse us with the Word. Cleanse our minds. Let it get deep inside of us. Give us a hunger and a thirst for Your Word, Lord God. That we would be filled with it. And like you said, we'll never thirst again. Not for the natural. Because we'll be desiring the spiritual. Fill us with your word, Lord. Cleanse us today. And for that brother, that sister right now. That, 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 that's sitting in their living room. Or driving down the road. Or, or and listening to me as they travel. Or, or God, they're, they're in the bed to this morning. Or wherever they are. Hearing, hearing the sound of my voice. And they're saying, I need you, Jesus. I need a change. I need you to touch me today. As they cry out to you, Lord. We know your word says you're there. And you're hearing them. And you're saving them. The word, the word tells us if we believe in our heart. And confess with our mouth. You said repent and be filled and be saved. And Lord, as they do that now, they are being changed. I, I believe that with everything that's in me. I believe your word. And it is life. Refresh us today, O oh God. Renew us by your word. Renew our minds by your word. Renew our hope by your word. Renew our spirit by your word. Help us to stand strong in your word. Let us speak your word in this famine of those that are not hearing your word. And let it bring life. Life-giving water flowing out of us, your people. To those around us who desperately need a drink from you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. Listen, if this is your first time with us or you're new with new life, or if you prayed that prayer and you asked the Lord, to, to come into your heart and to save you today or you came back home, then uh, why don't you click that link down there that says, I'm new here. You can go to our website and then there's another, there's one that says new here. It'll take you to a page and uh, just fill out a little form for us. Give us a little bit of information. We'd love to get some information in your hands, reach out to you, be able to pray with you and, uh, and celebrate with you. Listen, I love you so much. I bless you. I speak the favor of God over you. I want you to have a great week in Jesus' name. We'll see you next time.